Today on TwinCam, we're doing something a little bit different because our lovely world is now full of information. Gone are the days of that funny looking bloke down the pub being the fountain of useless knowledge. Today we have the internet to fill our heads with facts about cars that aren't facts. So here are four common automotive myths that just aren't true. Number one, the Alpha Sud was built with Soviet steel. Italian cars of the 1970s had a propensity to turn to dust. I don't think anyone would complain at that statement. But in the UK, it's often said that those rust issues were actually caused by horrendously poor quality steel provided by the government of the Soviet Union. This idea came about because of the existence of the VAZ 2101, a revised and rebadged version of the Fiat 124. Now, because the Soviet Union had a planned economy, they needed the consent of the government to go ahead with the project. And as the ruble was virtually worthless on the international stage, it's theorised that the USSR paid for the rights with steel, which was then provided to Alfa Romeo, which went into the production of the Alfa Sud. But I'm afraid that's just not true. While the Soviet government did somehow have to pay Fiat, the arrangement has zero connection to Alfa Romeo. While Fiat did eventually buy Alfa Romeo in 1986, three years after the Sud went out of production, the two companies had nothing in common beforehand. Fiat was its own independently controlled company, while Alfa was nationalised, meaning it belonged to the Italian government. In reality, the Alfa Sud steel was the same as that used by all Alphas, produced at a plant in Taranto, which just like the car company, was controlled by the state. The rust issues were only caused by poor production practices. Number two, the Mini didn't make any money. This one's a bit of a mixed bag because it both is and isn't true, and it all depends on when you say it. This myth comes from an investigation into the Mini's design that Ford orchestrated back in the early 60s. While they were churning out cart sprung dross, they were intrigued at how futuristic BMC's brilliant, if imperfect engineering was. They bought a Morris Mini, stripped it down and studied every component to figure out how they were building it for the price they were selling it. And their conclusion was that they weren't. They figured that the design and engineering were too good to be sold for the price and that BMC must be losing money. That sounds fair enough until you look at the wider picture. The Mini was built for 41 years between 1959 and 2000, and all major car manufacturers work with economies of scale. The investments into engineering and tooling can only be justified if they sell enough units, and to start with, BMC weren't. The Mini began life as a new and slightly weird concept. People weren't all that enamoured by it, and it didn't sell well. That was until around 1964, when the Mini's popularity exploded. It was joined by cars like the Austin and Morris 1100, which was Britain's best-selling car, and shared many of the Mini's components, lowering each car's build cost. The pair's global growth may have been stunted by politics, but in Britain, the Mini had staying power. Its best year was 1971, and it remained in Britain's top 10 until 1980, by which point it was 21 years old. As with any new concept in motoring, the Mini needed time to bed in. But once it did, it provided the scale and the entry point to British Leyland's empire. The company may have gone bankrupt in 1975, but there is an argument to be made that the Mini was the only car that secured its survival. While everything else was failing in the marketplace and forcing a financial drain, the Mini always remained popular. Number three, London taxis must carry a hay bale in the boot. Britain's full of stories about archaic laws that are unenforced but are still on the statute book. Stuff about the city of York and Welshmen and all that kind of rubbish. But this one stems from the Victorian era of horse-drawn hackney carriages. The Hackney Carriage Act of 1831 made it illegal for a horse to be fed on a street unless it was being fed with corn or hay from someone's hand. The idea was to keep the traffic moving by stopping lengthy food breaks and therefore the driver had to carry food in the carriage. 
Somehow, over the course of history, that was spun into carriages being required to carry a hay bale, and more recently into the belief that modern London taxis had to have the room to store a hay bale, but neither have ever been true. While it's a good story, so good in fact that poorly referenced clickbait news sites maintain it's a thing, the original law was repealed in 1976, but even before this, there was no stipulation that a taxi had to carry any hay. Number four, the Ford Model T was only sold in black. This is probably the most famous of all these myths, stemming from that Henry Ford quote, any customer can have a car painted any color he wants, so long as it is black. But he was lying. That came from Mr. Ford's autobiography, and he supposedly made this declaration to the management in 1909, but that's an impossibility. The Model T was built between 1908 and 1927, and black wasn't even available as a factory colour until 1913. Instead, you could get it in red, grey, blue or green, but the latter two were very dark shades. So dark, in fact, that they could be mistaken for black. But from 1913 to 1925, black was the standard colour. So there is an element of truth to this one, but it's a rather large caveat to a sweeping statement. In the final few years of production, again, you could get a Model T in a range of colours. But before we move on, there's more than meets the eye with the Model T's paint. Because those blacks weren't painted in the way we'd imagine they were. The black was actually a varnish that was either brushed on, flowed on, or the bodies dipped in it. And it was chosen because it was cheap, durable, and had good damp proofing properties. Unfortunately, there's no evidence to suggest that it dried quicker. And let's have a final bonus one. The Austin Allegro was more aerodynamic going backwards than it was going forwards. This one's a bonus because it is true. And I wanted to put it in here because I'd like to explain why. This one's commonly used as a joke to attack the poor Allegro with. They had the fair share of issues, but please, if you're going to dislike a car, dislike it for something that actually matters. The reality is that the majority of cars are more aerodynamic going backwards than they are going forwards. And the very simple explanation for that is the radiator grill. Having a big hole in the front of the car and all the surface area of the radiator isn't conducive to good aerodynamics, but it's necessary to keep the engine cool. This is part of why cars in the 80s and 90s began to feature smaller hidden grills and why companies like BMW with their modern monstrosities of grills feel the need to introduce electronically controlled covers that open and close the grill when necessary. The Allegro was designed at a time when aerodynamics weren't the centre of the design team's attention, so it isn't a massively slippery shape, but don't let a fact that's common to most cars cloud your view of the little Austin. And with that, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then follow the link in the description, and I'll have more videos coming along soon.